Welcome. This is Airrail Images Video Magazine number 33. I'm Fred Johnson and I'll be your host. The B-40 bomber escort was a tantalizing concept that did not live up to initial expectations. When unescorted bomber formations proved unsustainable in the face of aggressive German fighter attacks, American responses centered on developing fighters with greater range to protect the bombers and limited tests of converted bombers as gunships to be placed at strategic locations within the bomber formation. A B-17 bomber escort variant, the B-40, showed initial promise. Lockheed's Vega plant embellished work already done to a B-17F at Cheyenne, Wyoming, where the Fortress Modification Center had installed a boosted power tailgun mount and a dummied-in Bendix chin turret. A second top turret, built by Martin, was added in the radio room area of the B-17. This gave the B-40 one Sperry upper turret and one Martin upper turret. The waist gun mounts were given two instead of one machine gun each. Where many combat B-17s ultimately carried about 4,000 to 5,000 rounds of ammunition, the service test YB-40 could carry as much as 17,000 rounds for short missions, with a normal load of more than 11,000 rounds for longer sorties. Service ceiling on the XB-40 was limited to 29,400 feet, more than a mile and a half lower than that for a standard B-17F bomber variant. Between May and August of 1943, the YB-40s flew combat missions with the 92nd as well as other 8th Air Force bomb groups to test their merit. Early on, the front gun of the twin gun waste window mounts experienced ammunition feed issues and tail mounts had problems as well. The YB-40s stood down for a couple weeks while fixes were made in England. A statistical tally said the estimated increase in firing power of the YB-40 over a traditional B-17F was 20% while the effectiveness of the bomber escort against German fighters was only 10% better than a regular fortress. And it was believed that the majority of this 10% increase in effectiveness came from the Bendix chin turret. The YB-40s had additional liabilities. Placement of the second top turret in the radio compartment blocked one avenue of escape, especially if ditching became necessary. And the dual waste guns obscured more of the waste openings for escape as well. The YB-40s could keep up with the formation of loaded bombers inbound to the target, but once empty the regular B-17s were faster on the exit unless the YB-40s flew with higher power settings which aggravated gasoline consumption. Sometimes the returning YB-40s had to seek the nearest landing field before running out of gas. Also, a heavy YB-40 could not maintain formation on three engines. Army Air Force's evaluators rethought the wisdom of sending a crew in a converted heavy bomber in harm's way when the bomber no longer contributed to bombs on target and its very configuration posed hazards to the crew. The YB-40 armed escort would not enter mass production, but its revolutionary chin turret would, on late delivery B-17Fs and especially on the B-17G model of the Flying Fortress. In May 2020, California reverberated to the sound of as many as six C-130Js overhead. The 146th Airlift Wing of the California Air National Guard put many of its Super Hercules aircraft in the air during a COVID morale flyover, as well as for training opportunities during the month. Two of the C-130s carried day-glow markings for use as aerial firefighters. The 146 is based at Channel Islands Air National Guard Station in Port Huynimi.
seldom seen British contributions to the success of the Berlin Airlift included huge four-engine short Sunderland flying boats pressed into service to carry tons of supplies from the Hamburg area to Lake Wannsee and the River Havel near Berlin. The flying boats operated from July 1948 into December when the peril of ice in the water curtailed their use. These excerpts are from a British film from that era. This is a story of the Berlin Airlift, the operation carried out by the Royal Air Force and the United States Air Force to supply two and a quarter million people of Berlin with food, coal, and other necessities of life. Sunderland flying boats of coastal command were ordered in to supplement the land-based planes. These took off from the Elbe at Hamburg and came down on one of Berlin's lakes. Food, still more food, and raw materials had to be poured across the aerial bridge into the blockaded city. Only one narrow corridor led from the base on the Elbe near Hamburg to the unloading base at Havel Lake in the British sector of Berlin. Within four days of the decision to use them, the first giant boats, each carrying five tons of vital material, were on air transport service. You are prepared to take off, over. way daily over the port of Hamburg, destination Berlin. past the Olympic Stadium and presently over the only power station left working in the western sector. Immediately on landing, unloading commences and the machines are prepared for the return journey. return trip, exportable freight was carried and the opportunity taken to remove some of Berlin's sick children for convalescence. Only the very worst weather kept Allied aircraft out of the sky. Even through storms and mists, the hazardous chain of supply went on. As dusk falls, Sunderlands tie up for the night. Although doing valuable service, the Sunderlands part was small compared to the land-based plane.
rifle rudder. And thanks for watching Air Rail Images Video Magazine number 33. The rest of the Air Rail Images Video Magazines are on the Air Rail Images channel. Please take a look.